Good evening. It's great to see each of you here. I'm grateful that you have braved the, the cold, wintry weather that we have not yet had the joy of experiencing this season. I feel like it's a little bit late. I feel like we're in spring with all this uh, rain and tornadoes and all that stuff that we've been experiencing. But regardless of all that, I'm grateful that you're here. I'm thankful that we have this opportunity to worship God. I know again that today we did somewhat of a swap. Generally, we talk about these, this idea of Christian living on Sunday mornings, looking through the book of Second Peter, but just due to the theme that we're going to talk about over the course of the next year, I wanted to put that this morning, and we're going to talk about this idea of Christian living tonight, specifically this topic of godliness. Now, if you've been with us over the course, I feel like it's been a long time. I feel like we've been in the book of Second Peter for a really long time. Only three weeks left after this, and I promise we'll get out of Second Peter, and we'll move on to something else. Uh, But we've been talking about several different things, talking specifically about these Christian graces um, that we have, that we find here in 2 Peter chapter 1. We've talked about faith, we've talked about virtue, we've talked about knowledge, self-control, perseverance, and tonight we're going to talk about godliness. And as we do that, I want you to keep this in mind. You remember going back again, all the way back to week one, we talked about how all of these graces, they build upon one another. How you cannot have one of these and then take all of the others out. You cannot pick and choose. That's this whole idea of living a Christian life. You must um, allow yourself to submit to every single one of these characteristics if we want to be faithful and if we want uh, to be pleasing to Almighty God in this life. What exactly is godliness? I know it's not really a term I guess you and I use in our everyday language. I don't go around talking about the word godliness all the time. Um, So what is godliness? I think it's important to define our terms as we begin every single session talking about 2 Peter chapter 1. Or rather, Um, godliness is this idea of being humble, a humble reverence and a deep piety towards our almighty God in heaven above. It is this idea of being godlike. In other words, you as a Christian, as an individual, you have a deep reverence and fear and respect for Almighty God, for what He is, what He's done, what He continues to do for us, and that affects every single decision that you make in this life. Every single choice, thought, word, whatever it might be that you do in life, because you live a life of godliness, it affects all of those things that you and I do in our daily lives. In fact, I want you to notice this quote. But the guy in Wood said this, he said, the desire to be godlike is the motive from which all of our actions should originate. And without which, without that, there can be no acceptable service rendered to Almighty God. If we are going to be godly, if we're going to have godliness as a characteristic in our lives, you and I must be aware of His desires and His purposes for me as a Christian while I'm living in this life. In other words, I am going to dethrone myself. I'm going to put my will to the side. I'm going to put my passions and my desires off to the side. And I'm going to submit myself to Almighty God and what He has said for me to do within His Word. I am going to live out what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 16, where he said, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Talking about this idea of humbleness. I am going to be doing what Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, where he said that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who am living, but it is Christ who is living in me. If you and I don't do this, if we don't live godly, if we don't live a life like God, then you and I are not pleasing to Him in this life. I want to go to Hebrews chapter 12 as we begin this evening. Hebrews chapter 12. And I think that this is a verse that sometimes in our religious world gets misunderstood and misinterpreted just simply because of some of the language that is used. But I want to look at this very briefly for just a moment. Notice Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with me in verse 28. Notice the language here. The writer there, the writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, Since we are receiving a kingdom, notice this, which cannot be shaken. What's the kingdom? What is the kingdom that the Hebrews writer is talking about? What he's talking about is that which was established on the day of Pentecost back in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. He's talking about the church. Talking about the body of people, the body of Christ that you and I are a part of. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. That's all that he's talking about there when he says kingdom. He's talking about the church of Jesus Christ. Notice this as he continues on. He says, let us have have grace. 
Let us have grace. If you're reading out of the New American Standard or you're reading out of the English Standard, it renders it to be the word gratitude or that you're grateful, but it carries this same idea and this same thought. I want you in your minds to go all the way back to lesson chapter to lesson number one, if you can remember that far back to when we first started talking about 2 Peter chapter 1. And you remember we talked about the idea of grace. Grace is something that you and I don't deserve, and yet we are still given the opportunity to take it. We're still given the opportunity to obtain it. And within that are so many of the Christian blessings that we're able to have. But think about it. Think about the church. The church, no doubt, is one of the greatest blessings that God has ever given to us. You and I don't deserve the church. We don't deserve to have the fellowship with one another. We don't deserve the opportunity to come before God and to worship and to live praise before His name. We don't deserve that opportunity. And yet, because of the grace of God, He's given us the opportunity to be here. That's what He's talking about when He says, let us have grace. Notice the next phrase, the next two words. By which. Because of the grace that I have just talked about. Because of the undeserving gifts that you have, by all of that, you and I, notice next, we may serve God acceptably. We may serve God acceptably. I want you to notice the language. Hebrews writer, are you telling me that I as a Christian can serve God in an acceptable way? Are you saying that I can look at the Scriptures, I can put my life next to it, and I can certainly obey you and do what you have commanded and told me to do? Absolutely, the Hebrews writer is telling us that. He's telling us that the commandments are not grievous, they're not burdensome. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. But within that same thought, there is also the idea that because someone can serve God acceptably, someone can also what? Not serve God acceptably. Someone could be on the flip side of that coin and not be doing what God has commanded him or her to do. Serve God acceptably according to His will. That's the only way you and I can please God in this life. But then notice how he closes this verse. He says, with reverence, and then also how does he say it? With godly fear. With reverence and with godly fear. This word here for godly fear in the Greek is the exact same word that Peter uses in 2 Peter chapter 1 when he's talking about the idea of godly fear. It give, or rather, talking about godliness. It gives us the exact same idea that if you and I as Christians in this life on this earth are going to serve God, if we're going to put God first in our lives, not just serve Him, but to do so in an acceptable manner and in an acceptable way, it has to be done how? with reverence, with respect, with fear for God. Reverence and godly fear. By living and by showcasing my fear and my respect for Almighty God, for what He has done, for what He has told us to do within His Word. That's what it all boils down to when you and I are Christians. How we live our lives, it's going to be dictated by our reverence and our respect for Almighty God. If you respect Him, if you have fear and reverence for Him, you're going to study this book and you're going to allow it to guide you and to dictate you in this life. If you don't study, if you don't do it, then you don't have that godliness and that godly reverence and fear. Not only that, but we ought to see it also as a privilege privilege to be able to be able to live our lives in the way that God would have you and I to do so. We must be grateful for the opportunity that you and I get every single day to wake up and to serve our God in heaven above simply because of what he's done for us. Think about all that our God has done for us, all that Jesus has done for us. Now we get an opportunity to serve him and to love him in the way that he has commanded us to do so. I want to go to the book of 1 Timothy as we continue on through our study. I want to go to the book of 1 Timothy, and I want to look at this idea of godliness within this book. It is literally peppered all throughout this entire book, and we're not even going to look at all of the passages here that talk about this idea of godliness, but I want to read just a few of these. Again, we don't have time to get into these, but I want to just read a few of them. 1 Timothy chapter 2, with talking about this idea of godliness, notice it here, beginning in chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, Paul says to to young Timothy, therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life, notice this, in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Go down just a little bit further. Look at verse 9 and verse 10. In like manner also, Paul continues to talk, that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women, notice this, professing what? Godliness with good works. Notice another verse. Go to chapter 4. Look with me here, beginning in verse 7. Paul is continuing his thought to Timothy. He says, but reject profane and old wise fables 
Exercise yourself towards what? Towards godliness. Push yourself towards a godly way of living. Towards this idea of having respect and fear for God. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Another one. Go to chapter 6. Look at with me here at verse 6. And chapter 6 actually talks a lot about this idea of godliness. We just don't have time to get into every single one of them. Chapter 6, notice verse 6, a verse we probably all know by heart. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. And then one more passage. Go just a couple of verses later. Go look at verse 11. But you, O man of God, Paul tells Timothy, flee these things. What is he talking about? He's talking about, going back to verse 10, talking about the love of money. Going back all the way into chapter into verse 3, going down, talking about all of these sins that people commit. He says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and do what? Pursue, go after, reach for righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. We, again, we don't have time to dive into each of these verses, but they all surround this idea of godly living. Of you and I willing to put our passions and wants and desires to the side and we're willing to look at God and say, you have reign in my life. You are the authority over everything that I do. I'm willing to submit to you. And I'm going to love you in the process. That's this whole idea of godliness. If we are going to implement godliness into our everyday lives, it is going to affect every single choice that you and I make in our lives. What am I doing? Is it godly? The things that I'm saying, are they godly? The places that I'm going, is I, am I professing a characteristic of godliness? It is something that we should all think about with every single decision and every single choice that we make. Is what I'm doing God-like? In fact, I want to draw our attention very, very briefly to three different areas within this idea of godliness. In what areas of our lives is godliness commanded? And there's a lot more in uh, that we just don't have time to talk about. Number one, I want to look at this idea of our worship. And I, I'm not going to, to labor here very long because two weeks ago we talked very extensively about what our worship should look like. But godliness is commanded in our worship. In other words, let me ask you this question. Do you and I, and I've, we said this a couple weeks ago, but do you and I, when we come into the assemblies, when we approach God with our worship, do we do so with fear and respect and reverence for God and who He is and what He's done for us? Do we understand the gravity of the situation whenever we walk into the assembly and we offer worship before our Father in heaven? It is such a serious matter. The nature of our worship that we offer to Him, is it godly? Is it with, filled with this idea of fear and reverence and understanding I'm going to worship you in the way that you want me to? If you and I are going to be godly, then it means we're going to do what he has commanded us to do. And that is also within the realm of our worship. We're going to worship him, John 4 and verse 24, in spirit and in truth. And again, we talked extensively about that a couple of weeks ago. Number two. In what areas is godliness commanded? Well, in our living. And I guess this kind of covers all of our bases, doesn't it? Because we just don't have time to talk about every single area of our lives. But I've said it before and I'll say it again. Godliness, if we're going to be godly, if we're going to have godliness as a characteristic, it should affect our lives in every single aspect. I think about what Paul wrote to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You and I have to understand that we are on this earth as a sacrifice to God. In other words, we're going to put everything we want to do out of our lives. We're going to look at God and say, what can I do to please you? How can I be putting you first in my life? What can I do to make sure you are a top priority for me with every decision that I make? Godliness is commanded in every area of our lives, specifically within this idea of our living. Every choice we make, is it godly? And then number three, godliness is commanded within this idea of doctrine. Within this idea of doctrine, when we look at the Word of God, do we look at it with the attitude and with the mindset of, this is the words of our Creator? Do we understand what we're able to hold in our hands? I think you and I take for granted so many times the fact that God has literally put to paper His commands for you and I, and He has given them to us, and we now have the opportunity to do what He has told us to do. 
I think so many times we take that for granted. Do we respect God as it pertains to His Word? We understand the Bible's from Him. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. But do we respect that? Do we respect it enough to where whenever we study the Bible, we look at those things that we learn and then we apply them to our lives? If you want to be godly, if you want to have a characteristic of godliness, when you study, you're going to again have that fear and respect. And when you do that, you're going to put those things into your life. You're going to do all that you can to be pleasing to Him in this life. The last thing I want to talk about, we wouldn't, I, I should have told you this before, we're not going to take too much time to, to talk about this idea. I know several people got to get home because of weather and things like that. But we'll go through this fairly quickly. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I want to look at this as we close uh, th- this evening. 2 Timothy chapter 3. When you look at the context here, the Apostle Paul has been encouraging his young protege, Timothy, the young preacher, to be strong. He says, I want you to stand up and to be strong. I want you to stand up for yourself. I want you to understand difficult days are coming. Difficult times are coming. And what he's telling him, he says, don't allow hardships and difficulties to hinder your work for Almighty God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, notice with me here, beginning in verse 1. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy this, he says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Notice this last one. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And then he says, and from such, I want you to turn away. I want you to look, number one, as we look at this idea, you look at verse one, what is Paul telling Timothy? He says, you're going to struggle. There's going to be severe opposition for you in this life. In other words, you're going to face those difficult and those horrible times. In fact, the way that he says this is quite interesting because it gives us this idea, if, again, if you go back to the Greek language, if you look at that, that phrase of perilous times, it gives you this idea of an ugly wound. In other words, it's a situation that you and I would never ever want to be in. It's a situation that Timothy's not going to want to be in because he's going to have to face something that he doesn't want to have to go through. Those difficulties, the opposition, the hardships, the trials, the struggles. He's going to have to go through all of those things as a Christian and as a preacher. You and I know Timothy must have been living a godly life at that point. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, what does Paul tell him? He says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Shall suffer persecution. If you live a godly life, you're going to face struggles. If you live a godly life, a Christian life, a life of godliness, you're going to face difficult times. But that's the thing about Christianity. We've said this before. Christianity is not like this walk in the park. It's not this easy life that you and I get to sit back and relax and everything gets handed to us. It's hard work being a Christian is, but I promise you it is rewarding. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Timothy was obviously already living a godly life because of the difficulties that he was facing for the cause of Christ. You continue on through this passage and you get to verses 2 and verse all the way through verse 5. And listed here are some 19 different sins. 19 different things that you and I as Christians Christians should never, ever, ever be partaking in. 19 different things that Paul lists and tells Timothy, here are things that they are going to be doing. Things that you are going to see, that you're going to have to face, that you're going to have to preach against. And I wish that we had time to dive into each one of these. We just simply don't do that. But I think it's interesting if you notice how verse 2 begins with the word, the three-letter word for, F-O-R. In other words, Paul is telling Timothy, he says, look, this is why you are going to be facing these difficult times. This is why all of these hardships are going to be coming into your life. It's not because of anything that you've done. It's not because of any bad decision that you've made, but it's because of all of these sins that these people are committing. It's because of everything that they've done that you're going to be facing and going through these difficult times. After all, is that not why bad things happen today? Because of sin, right? We talked about sin this morning. How sin, the the terrible nature of sin, how sin ruins everything. Sin is never, ever good in any situation. It brings hardships and difficulties not only for you but also for everybody around you James chapter 1 and verse 15 James said that when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown does what it brings forth death nothing good ever ever comes from sin every terrible thing in this world ultimately stems from sin but I find it interesting that within this list and really if you go all the way to the bottom of this list you look at verse 5 he begins verse 5 by talking about this last one this idea of a form of godliness. 
Having a form of godliness. It's interesting to me. Not only do these individuals here have all of these sins within their lives. Not only do these individuals that he's talking about have all of these terrible characteristics that they are playing out into their lives. Not only all of that, but they're religious. They are religious. They have some form of godliness. They have some form, some picture, some depiction of Christianity and at least who they should be in this life, at least on the outside. Think about it. They show up to worship. Sundays, Sunday nights, Wednesdays. They come back even when they don't have to, quote-unquote have to in the minds of other people. They show up for gospel meetings. They show up for youth rallies. They show up for lectureships. They show up for all these other things. But man, throughout the rest of the week, what do they do? They're not doing it. They don't want to be a Christian. They're going to hang it up, put it on the shelf, and they're going to get it back down when it comes time to go to worship. When it comes to making tough choices, they're out. They don't want to do it anymore. On the outside, sure, they look godly, don't they? On the outside, when they go to different places, when they go to worship, yeah, they look like they're Christians. They look like they're godly. They look like they're putting God first, like they have a fear and reverence and respect for God. But behind closed doors, when they're with their friends, when they're with their coworkers, when they're with the people who are outside of the body of Christ, it all goes out the window. Why is it that people think, oh, you know, you better not do that. You're you're in the church building. You better not say those things. Oh, you better not, you better not wear that. You're in the church building. You, be, you can't do that, right? Friends, if we can't do it in the church building, why should we do it anywhere else? If we can't do it here in the assembly, why can we not do it anywhere else? They had a form of godliness. They had a facade of religion. But they have warped it and they have twisted it into what they want it to be. Which begs the question, as we close this evening, what about us? What about you and I? as individuals, as Christians. When it comes to this idea of godliness, do you and I, have we implemented godliness into our lives? Or, as we come week by week, do we have a form of godliness? Do we have a form of godliness? When it comes to us in our Christian lives, do we put forth the effort? Do we work to be a diligent Christian? To study the Bible? To do all that it has told us to do, even when it takes effort and work? What about all the other times? You know, Christianity, and this may be kind of a crude illustration, but Christianity is not like a buffet. It's not like you get to just pick and choose different things that you want. It's a fixed menu. You get what you get, and that's all that there is to it. You can't pick and choose. You can't go off the beaten path. Christianity is set in stone. It is how you must live your life. And if you do anything extra or less than that, then you are not pleasing to God in this life. If you want salvation and if you want heaven, then living a life of godliness is a requirement. Not our own form of godliness, not somebody else's form of godliness, but rather godliness that says, I'm going to revere and respect God. I understand what Jesus Christ has done for me. It has impacted my life so much so to where I'm going to submit myself to him because I know that without Jesus in my life, my life is lost. My life is hopeless and there is nothing left for me if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. Not our own form of godliness, but the way that God has prescribed for every single one of us. Are you living a life of godliness? It's a question that we have to ask every single, every single day, every single time we wake up. Am I going to live a life of godliness? Am I going to look at Scriptures and am I going to open it up and am I going to take the things that I learned, take the things that I know, am I going to put them into my lives and then am I going to put the effort in to actually acting those things out? It's a question we have to ask ourselves and you know, every single time we meet, we're, we're, we're granted the opportunity to repent of our sins. For us as Christians, we're granted the opportunity to make our lives right. Maybe your life is not lived in a li- with, a, with this idea of godliness in it. Maybe your life is not what it should be because you're not reverencing and respecting Almighty God. If that's the case, know that you can change that. You can come forward and you can put all those things behind you. You can rededicate yourself to Almighty God. You can say, God, I am going to respect you and revere you to the point to where I am going to look at your word. I'm going to take everything that I can and I'm going to put it into my life and then I'm going to apply it and adhere to it. I'm going to obey it to the best of my ability.
Or maybe you're here this evening and you're not a Christian. What better way to kick off your new year? What better way for us to kick off all of our new years than to see someone baptized into Christ, to see someone dedicate their lives in service to Jesus Christ? Know that you can do that. You can come forward. We can baptize you. The water representing the shed blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, washing away your sins. And if, So if that's your need, if you need to be baptized, if you need to come forward and repent of your sins, if you simply need the encouragement of your brothers and sisters, know we're here to help you. We're here to help you in whatever way that we can. If you have a need, won't you come? Together we stand and as we sing.